So now we can begin. First, I'd like to begin by telling you that uh, I am, in fact, Father Francis Marathi. <laughs> These are different, very different pictures. Um, but just to show you that it's me. <laughs> so, thanks. Yep. Just I don't want you to think I was pulling one over on you. Okay, so I uh, edited it here with a couple of our characters that we'll talk about this evening. One is named uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and the other one is Al Ghazali. But I was just messing around because I had nothing else to do and uh, put them on there. Makes me look better. So, okay. So the topic uh, for these next three weeks is apologetics. And there's three different steps to apologetics. But in general, when we think of apologetics, we usually think of, uh, by the way, did everyone get a worksheet, a little uh, outline, handout? I hope I made enough. Um, when we think of apologetics, the first thing usually that comes to mind is like battling with scripture verses with someone, like comparing scripture verses and saying, oh, well, this book says this, or this book says that, or this verse says this, this verse says that. That's a really, that's far down the road at the end of apologetics. There's all this other groundwork that needs to be done before you even get to that point where that can be helpful. Because when you are arguing or having a conversation about the faith, okay, or about scripture, and it gets into interpretation and things like this, no one's going to make any progress unless you first establish whether or not, first of all, God actually exists, okay, second of all, whether or not uh, scripture is inspired, and from scripture, whether or not you can glean that God himself instituted a divinely inspired teacher to actually guide and authoritatively teach what's in Scripture. Okay, so simply going back and forth about Scripture verses doesn't help if you start that way. That's why we're doing this. Also, as part of the new evangelization, um, it's really helpful not just to evangelize and kind of reteach the faith to some of our Catholic or other Christian brothers and sisters, but also as the world becomes increasingly... Um, uh, skeptical about God's existence, you need to adapt the way you talk to people and back up this, the common ground that you start at. You can't start at Scripture with a lot of people because they say, I don't care about Scripture. What is it? You say it's divinely inspired, I don't care. So you back up another step and you say, okay, we want to talk about, just based on our reason, whether or not God exists because that's common ground with everyone. It's just your reason. You're setting aside whether or not you're religious you're just using, working from what everyone has, and that is your intellect. And that's why apologetics has these three steps, which conveniently follow the, three, the next three weeks, or the next two weeks after this week, that we'll be doing apologetics. Three successive steps. Oh, by the way, this is all based on, kind of as a motto for this presentation, 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. So know what you're talking about and be able to talk about it and defend it and promote it well with your reason. Okay? Um, we do not believe as Catholics in uh, the idea of faith alone in the sense that we, we shun or eschew reason as something inimical to the faith or something dangerous to the faith. We say, no, God gave us our reason to be employed in service of the faith. So we're not called to be irrational, fideistic people that just say, I just believe. No, you believe with reason. Okay? God made us different from everyone else, all the other animals, all the other creatures, in that we are dignified and have reason. And we're to use that for His greater glory. We're to use that to come to know Him Okay? and to help explicate, explain a bit better our faith to those who maybe don't understand it. Okay, so apologetics, first of all, means giving an account, a defense, a reasoning for your faith. Um, usually when we say apology, we don't think of giving a defense. We think of just saying I'm sorry or saying I'm to blame. But apologetics is based on the precise meaning of the word apologia, which is to give a defense, an accounting, or reasoning. And in this, in this um, specific context, an account of why it is you believe in God, how it is you know that, why it is you believe Scripture is inspired by God and uh, tells you something relevant and important, and why it is you believe your Catholic faith is the true faith when instituted by Christ. Okay? So, these are the three steps. I've kind of just briefly already summarized them. Natural apologetics, which is what we're doing tonight. Natural, it's called natural because you're not taking into account divine revelation. You're not taking into account the supernatural. You're just starting from reason. Like I said, that's the common starting ground for every human person, is reason. Whether or not they're a believer. And you can start with 
reason. You can start with your intellect. So, natural apologetics is that by which we first demonstrate God's existence aided only by our reason and the phenomena observed in nature. Okay, that's the first step. There's other things related to this, uh, as you'll see on your worksheet. Um, we don't have time to do all of them, but proofs for God's existence, the divine attributes, what we can say about God, what is God like, still only by our reason, and we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, proving the immortality of the soul by our reason. Okay, and proving objective morality from our reason. Again, tonight we will not be taking into account supernatural revelation at all. Because it's kind of this groundwork. So that we can have a more universal base to talk to anyone whom we might encounter. Not just other Catholics or just other Christians, but any person of goodwill. Okay? <laughs> Christian apologetics, that's the next step. So you start with natural reason, then you make the next step and you say, still using only our reason and using uh, certain instruments and standards of, scripture, or of uh, textual scholars and historians, we show how it is we know that the Gospels, again, not considering them as divinely inspired, but just as documents, as historical documents, proving that they are reliable historical documents. Okay, again, just on the natural sphere here proving that the Gospels give an accurate historical account of the events that are narrated in them. Once that's done and you establish the Gospels are credible, authentic witnesses to a historical event, then when that's done, you move on to Catholic apologetics, meaning now that you've established that the Gospels represent faithfully a historical event and testimony, you can then can say, okay, since that really happened, as best we can tell based on the evidence, we look at what is said in the Gospels about Christ, what He said, what He did. And since we've proven that God exists and that He was likely to reveal Himself, that He did in fact reveal Himself and that was recorded in sacred scripture, then we are bound morally and just reasonably to adhere to what is said by the one who has proven to be God historically. Okay? Does that make sense? That's the process. So prove God exists and that He's likely to reveal Himself. Look for the most likely and probable historical revelation, which we say would be the four Gospels, as historical accounts. And then based on what is seen in those historical accounts, uh, showing that Christ did in fact institute a church. That's why it's called Catholic apologetics. That Christ instituted the one church, the Catholic church. Okay? That's the three steps. So, natural apologetics, our first step. I have here uh, a famous uh, painting by Raphael, and it's uh, called The School of Athens. And it's a huge picture, this is just a detail of it, it's a huge picture that has uh, all famous philosophers throughout history, uh, pagan philosophers, ancient philosophers. And here you have uh, Plato and Aristotle. And the reason I put them is because they both, before Christ even came, did what we're doing tonight. They reasoned out philosophically, they came up with demonstrations, metaphysical, philosophically certain demonstrations that God exists without the aid of revelation. Okay? That's why they're up here. Uh, looking all fancy. <laughs> okay. Like I said, we're dealing with arguments that are considered demonstrative. They're not hypotheses like, it seems that God's the best explanation of things we see. It seems that God is, makes a lot of sense that God did this or that God exists. No, these are, by the ones who came up with these arguments, these are intended to be demonstrative. That is, certain and proven demonstration that God exists. Logically necessary. In other words, if the premises of the arguments they give are true, then the conclusion is necessarily true. Not just a hypothesis, it's necessarily true. So we can actually come to certain knowledge that God exists, just with our reason. And not just that, well, I'll say something about this first. The one objection that usually comes even from Catholic circles at this point is, we shouldn't be overly rational about this. We shouldn't be trying to like prove things scientifically. We shouldn't, we should, it's all about faith. Okay, in a sense that's true. But your faith has content. You don't just say, it's not like a, a child is born and says, I spontaneously believe in everything Christ revealed. You're like, who's Christ? How did you even know that? There's content to your faith. You need to know something. You need to embrace certain truths with your mind in order to assent to them and to allow your life to be changed by those truths. It's not just this blind leap of faith. Okay? Faith is a grace, it's a gift, of course, and we can't work towards that grace, but we can prepare ourselves and dispose others to that grace of faith by preparing them with our reason, by showing the probability, the rationality, in fact, even the certainty that God exists, 
and that he revealed himself. Okay, so faith and reason always go together. That's distinctively Catholic. Um, you have the opposition to that idea right around the Protestant Reformation when um, there was this huge opposition to scholastic theology. They thought it was overly rationalistic and so it was kind of rejected altogether. That was a big mistake to say you want to take out reason from the whole picture. You can't do that. It's always been a beautiful marriage of faith and reason in our faith that we are given our intellect for a particular purpose to come to know God using it. And so it would be stupid to uh, rid ourselves of it. This is a quote from the First Vatican Council. So you might be surprised to know that it's actually a doctrine of the church that you don't need divine revelation to know that God exists. Okay? First Vatican Council taught that. And it seems like a strange thing to say. Most of us came to know God because we were brought up in the faith. Okay? What the Vatican Council is saying is it is possible to know God with certainty only with the aid of our reason. And that's basically just falling off of St. Paul. St. Paul says that we can come to know God through the things that he has made. So the church is basically saying that, that same thing, that we can come to know God with our reason. Now, we can't come to know that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can't come to know that um, he is going to take on human nature in the incarnation. Those are divine mysteries that need to be revealed. But what we can know is that God exists, that he is one, and certain other attributes that we'll get to later. But you're actually bound in conscience as a Christian to believe that you don't need supernatural revelation to know God exists. It's kind of a weird thing. But it shows the dignity with which uh, the church holds our, our reason. That God gifted us in our creation with reason that has such power and can have such clarity that it can reach Him unaided by uh, supernatural revelation. Okay. So, the most well-known demonstrations or proofs of God's existence come from St. Thomas Aquinas. And he actually follows along Aristotle, who you saw in that other picture, follows along the philosophy and the proofs of Aristotle, by which, um, look, taking into account certain phenomena in nature, you reason from that and you arrive necessarily at uh, God under different uh, titles that we'll see in a second. Five different titles. Um, and all that it's based on is a simple observed phenomenon. Each argument starts with one simple observed phenomenon that would be easily agreed by all. For example, the first way starts with, uh, it is clear that in nature some things are in motion. Okay? That's the only phenomenon he needs to start with and to uh, logically deduce that God necessarily exists. So it's very simple in a sense, but at the same time, these proofs are very, very difficult to grasp totally. A lot of people um, read them because St. Thomas lists them in very brief language and when you read them you, you oversimplify and you think, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't seem too mind-blowing. It doesn't seem like he proved that. It seems overly simple. But what's behind what he says is all these other implied arguments and all this other implied reasoning that people don't take the time to get into. So we're going to summarize that a bit. Again, they're intended to be demonstrative, certain arguments, not hypotheses. So uh, the church holds St. Thomas in high esteem saying these arguments are in fact uh, necessarily true if the premises are true. If the uh, givens of the argument are true, the conclusion that God exists follows necessarily. So the first way concludes, the conclusion of the first way is that there is a first mover, an unmoved mover that sets all of the other things in motion. The second way says there is a first cause of all other causes. The third way uh, concludes by saying there is a necessary being, a being that exists not because of some other cause, but necessarily. And there's a, the fourth way concludes that there is a perfect being, a being which uh, kind of comprehends in itself all perfection. And the fifth way concludes by saying there is some intelligent being, one, uh, some personal intellect that guides all others. Okay? We're only going to talk about the first way and probably We'll skip the third way, even though I put it on the, on the slideshow. We'll probably skip it and just go the first way and the fifth way. I'll kind of gauge the time to see if we can do the third way or not. Okay, the first way. You recognize this painting from the Sistine Chapel. It's Michelangelo. And what you'll see in a wider uh, picture is that this kind of this cloud of glory with the angels around him. Um, this is more pertinent to the fifth way, actually, but it's an interesting note that um, Michelangelo actually painted that kind of cloud around him in the exact anatomical shape of the human brain um, to show that basically what we're talking about here that God's creation is rational 
that there is order and reason to be discerned in creation. And so Michelangelo, the creation of man especially, puts this, you'll see it in a wider picture, but it looks exactly, it was uh, painted to the exact um, shape of the human brain, which is uh, at one, all at once beautiful and kind of gross. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. okay, so the simple observation that he starts with. We know from experience that some things are in motion. Pretty simple. Anyone object to that? Good. <laughs> Next step. Whatever is in motion is moved from a state of possible motion to a state of actual motion. Okay, what does that mean? There's going to be a lot of technical terms in here, but they really mean something very clear. I'll just explain it. So, um, this chair is something that can be moved. It's movable. And to move it from possible motion to actual motion, I move it. Okay? Anyone, that's fine, right? Okay. Anyone object that I'm moving this? Okay. Anything that's moved goes from potential or possible motion to actual motion by something else, something other than itself. So um, wood is potentially something that can be on fire. It is on fire when fire is actually applied to it. Okay? So there's this potential, potential brought to actual by something that is already actual. The chair is brought into motion by me. I'm already in motion. Okay? I'm in motion moving something that can potentially move. Pretty simple. Pretty simple concept, but using uh, technical language. Whatever is possibly in motion is only made actually in motion by something else that is actually in motion. Gave you an example. If that which puts something in motion is itself moved, it must be moved by something else. That just means, okay, I'm moving this chair that's potentially in motion, but something else is causing my motion. So there's this kind of going back and back and back. What's causing what to move? Um, if I push this, okay, my hand is moving the jar, and there's something um, that you can say the different muscles in my arm and then even farther back say my my desire to make an example is causing me to move so there's all these chains of causes that are causing other things to move right in order to cause motion you have a chain of causes um, that's a pretty simple concept I think everyone would agree to that that if I took my um, to add another link to the chain if I took my fancy pointer which by the way has a laser pointer Anyway, um, and I move the jar with it. Okay, the jar is being moved by the uh, remote, which is being moved by me, on back, on back, on back, okay? That's the picture he's painting. That whatever's moving is moved by something else, and if that thing that's moving, the first thing is moved, it's moved by something else, and so on and so on and so on. His conclusion is that can't go on infinitely. That can't continue on infinitely, because for any of those things to move, there needs to be something which is causing the motion which doesn't require something else to move it in the first place. Okay? That's the very simple structure, but that still requires some explanation. It still requires explanation of why that uh, concludes that God exists as the unmoved mover. Um, the first objection that comes to this is, this doesn't at all prove the God that we believe in, some loving, knowing, uh, personal God. Thomas doesn't intend to do that. He does not intend to do this. He just simply chooses to prove here that there is an unmoved mover, a first mover of all other things. And he says, this is what most people commonly call God. That's his only conclusion, bare bones conclusion. Now, there's, this is the important part. How this is demonstratively true that God exists. There's two kinds of chains that we could talk about. When I was talking about chains of causes, this is moving this, that's moving this, etc., etc. There's two kinds of series like that. The first one is what we think about most easily would be a set of dominoes. Okay? You have a line of dominoes and you start the first one and they all follow. This one falls, causes this one to move, causes this one to move, etc., etc. That is not what Thomas is talking about. That is not the idea, not the uh, image that he's using. In fact, he would say, if this is how the universe worked, there would be no need for God. If this is how things move, there would be no need for God. If coming in that doorway and coming across the room and coming out that doorway, there was a line of dominoes and no one saw where it began or where it ended, we could say, why should I believe that there was ever a first? Maybe these were just eternally in motion. And even if there was a first mover, once the first domino is pushed, there's no necessity that mover still exists. Okay, so nothing about this kind of series necessitates that we believe God exists. It's a different kind of series that he's talking about. It's called an essentially ordered series. That's the example I gave you, but I'll use a different one that's even clearer. An essentially ordered series, the example, the little picture here is you have a series of mirrors, okay, all reflecting onto the next one. And let's say we have a bunch of uh, mirrors coming through this room and showing a 
laser point on the wall over there. Okay? We would say there has to be someone with a laser pointer at the end there causing us to see it here. It can't be that it just reflects, reflects, and flex, and then it stops somewhere down the line. There has to be someone down there pressing it now so that we see it here and now. Do you see how that's different from the dominoes? Because with the dominoes, the one can fall and cease to be important to the rest of the series. If a domino falls, causes the next one to fall, it's not important anymore because the motion keeps going without it. But with a series of mirrors and a laser, those aren't going to reflect the laser until, unless someone is at the beginning of it pressing the button so that I can see it here. An easier example, imagine I have a watch with a bunch of gears in it. I can add as many gears to that watch as I want, but unless there's a spring in the watch, none of the gears are going to move. So adding links on to infinity doesn't help in this kind of series. If someone says, let's put an infinite number of gears inside a watch, which you can't do, don't try it. Put an infinite number of gears in a watch. None of them are going to move. We're not going to see any effect of motion unless there is something first, the spring, that gets all of them moving. And they all move simultaneously. So this kind of series is something that accounts for an effect I see here and now. Another example. The jar is sitting on the table. The table is resting on the floor. The floor is resting on the ground, etc. On and on and on. Unless all of those things are acting here and now, lifting up each other, they're all acting simultaneously, unless there's something that finally is allowing all of these things to do that, something underneath all of them supporting them, allowing them to lift up that jar that I see here and now, unless there's that first thing, I wouldn't see the jar sitting here now. I wouldn't see it being supported by the table because nothing else could support it. It's kind of convoluted. Does that make sense? Why those two series are different? the dominoes versus the gears in a watch. In one case, you have all, all these things acting together at right here and now, acting together, caused by one thing. Once that spring stops working, all the gears stop working. Just like if the first mover stopped acting, all of this would just collapse. Okay? But with the dominoes, if there was a first being, set the first one in motion, it doesn't matter if he exists or not. They keep going by themselves. That's a very subtle distinction, but that's the only thing that makes sense of Thomas's argument, and that's what he intended to show. That for an effect I see here and now, there must be an unmoved mover that is acting here and now, allowing me to see the effect I see here and now. Okay? Any questions about that? I know that's kind of convoluted. It's important though. Really important. I'll just assume that was with, said with utter clarity, and no one has any. <laughs> So these two different kinds of series are what's important to remember. If he even allows that the world could be eternal in the past, even though by our faith we don't believe it, we believe there's creation, but he says let's allow that the world was eternal. Even if that were the case, it still wouldn't suffice to explain why I see the things I see here and now. Even if you had an eternally, you had an infinite line of dominoes in the past, it still wouldn't necessitate that you have uh, an unmoved mover at the beginning. He said, um, he didn't say this, but one of the commentators on St. Thomas said, trying to add links to the series to do away with God is like trying to, um, if I saw a canvas and like a, a paintbrush painting on it, it would be like trying to lengthen the handle that brush infinitely to try and not explain that there has to be a painter moving it. That's the idea. You have to, in this kind of series, you have to necessarily Logically, it's not a dispute, it's not a hypothesis, there has to be something first that's not itself caused by anything else, that's not itself moved by anything else, that is causing the motion. Okay? I'll end there with the first way. So the accidentally ordered causal series, the dominoes, it does not necessitate a first mover. The essentially ordered causal series, the gears and the watch, does require necessarily a first mover. Okay, so even at this point, you know, if you grasp that argument, you know that God exists already with that argument. <coughs> Necessarily, an unmoved mover exists. Certain things follow from that that uh, tell you what kind of unmoved mover it is, but right now you are certain that there is an unmoved mover, if you understand the argument. Okay, the third way we'll skip. <laughs> Even though that's a good uh, picture of Thomas there. He... Uh, Someone, I saw someone took this and uh, they put, my two greatest creations, my theology and my birdhouse. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Okay. If you want to know about the third way, I, I'll, you can just talk, tell, talk to me later. I don't know. It's, it's a bit more convoluted and less... Um, if you had trouble with the first one, you'll definitely have trouble with the third one. Um, it's, the third one's difficult. But they're all demonstratively true. It takes a while to work out the argument, especially if you only have like an hour and a half to do it. Um, but they are clear. They start from simple observed phenomenon and they follow by logical necessity. So after the first way, you know the unmoved mover exists. Yes? Very good question. So how, do, how is it that we know that our phenomena that we see out in nature are like the second series rather than the first? Well, remember that his uh, observed phenomenon that he starts with is that some things are in motion. So I would say all things are like that second series, but we wouldn't have to say that at all. We just have to say some things are like that. And so I gave a couple of examples, like uh, something being supported by the table. And then you go on down that series and you say, there's not going to be any support whatsoever unless there's some first thing supporting it here and now. You could say maybe there's other, uh, other phenomena in nature that are like the first series. That wouldn't matter as much, as long as there are some things like the second series. Okay? But very good question. The fifth way, I put a nice nature scene here in case any of you are bored with the talk. You can kind of uh, <laughs> reminisce about hunting uh, if any of you hunt uh, tigers. Um, but anyway, and dolphins, I don't know. So the reason I put the picture up there is because the fifth way, if you'll remember from the first list I gave you, the fifth way concludes to an intelligent order of the world. And the reasoning goes like this. The simple observation he starts with is that things in nature act for an end or a purpose or some kind of goal. So this kind of plant does this, always. This is how this plant acts. This is how this animal acts. This is what this animal does. This is what uh, this... Um, this is how this mineral forms, okay? We recognize each different thing by its different nature. What does it do? By certain effects, we can determine, oh, this is that kind of thing because that kind of thing produces this effect. That's all he's saying is certain things do specific things that are specific to them. A squirrel, um, you know, gathers acorns and buries them. I'm pretty sure that's all squirrels do. Um, I don't know what else squirrels do. That's a bad example, sorry. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's what they do? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um, actually, there's a, there's a book by a really brilliant uh, philosopher who talks, who probably gives the best explanation of the five ways I've ever read. His name's Dr. Ed Fazer, but he's very like snarky in his uh, explanation. Oh, he's very, very funny. And he says, he uses like chipmunks or squirrels, one of the two, that's probably why I thought of it. And he says, we recognize that ant, uh, animals and plants do specific things. If we saw a squirrel that, instead of climbing trees and gathering acorns, liked to lie spread eagle on the highway and eat toothpaste, we would know that that squirrel's not doing what squirrels do, okay? <laughs> and even though there are exceptions in nature here or there, individual exceptions, we recognize that in general, this animal does this, while this animal does that, this plant does this, while this plant does that. Okay, does that make sense? That's all he's saying, is that certain things do specific things in nature, and we observe that. Like, uh, that kind of bird grabs snakes and that giraffe swims. Is that a giraffe? It looks like a giraffe. Okay. Like it's just, his, like it's just his head sticking out. I should... It looks like the head of a giraffe. Thank you. Okay. Okay. That's what happens there. Apparently. Okay, so certain things in nature act for an end or a goal or a purpose, okay? But things that lack reason can't do that. Things that lack reason can't decide to do things or mark out goals for themselves and do them, right? That's just not possible. They don't have the ability to determine or discern goods and then pursue them by the appropriate means. But we see that they do, in fact, do that. Like a chipmunk can't... Um, Decide, I don't actually, I'll go back to squirrels because I don't know what chipmunks do. Squirrels can't like reason out that, oh, unless I eat an acorn uh, and, and kind of store some for the winter, I'll probably not have anything to eat. And they don't deliberatively think like that. But we see that they act as if they do. That's the, that's the strange phenomenon that he's noticing here. That everything acts for an end or a purpose, but lacking reason, they can't in fact do that on their own. Therefore, something other than themselves must be ordering them 
to that end. Ordering, I don't mean like commanding them, like squirrel, go gather acorns, but ordering them in the sense of giving them the, the particular kind of nature that in, in a way forces them to do that. So the conclusion here is that there is some intelligent agent that directs these non-rational creatures to their particular ends. Otherwise, how could we ever make the argument that just by chance, nature acts in so ordered a manner all the time, or for the most part. Like I said, there's exceptions where an animal seems to go outside of the normal uh, behavior of that animal. But we all recognize that's an exception. How otherwise would we explain that to be the case unless there was some mind ordering it? Even evolutionary language notices this because they say, in order to do this, in order to do that, the squirrel evolved in this way. So they recognize that it's all goal-oriented, right? Anytime uh, you'll hear someone talking about evolution, they say, oh, the, um, the snow leopard evolved this huge tail in order to balance it when it walked on mountain faces. I got that from Planet Earth. You guys watch Planet Earth? <laughs> it's like, Planet Earth's like the best argument for the fifth way ever. Um, I don't think Discovery Channel was intending to do that, but it's the best possible argument to see that this is true. Like, how can these things do this? with such complicated means and like how can something be so perfectly formed to do what it does. So I watched that and I was like this is the best evidence for Thomas's fifth way, the best evidence there is. And they actually said that, that same thing I just said, that the snow leopard evolved this big tail in order to balance it. Or even they don't say evolved, but they just notice he has that tail so that he can balance. Okay, as if it's just a given that things act in a, in a reasonable way and that things develop in a reasonable way. So even those who wouldn't be necessarily theists or believers in God recognize in their language that this is true, that nature acts for an end. And since these things aren't rational, one way we can tell that, by the way, an argument that um, animals, plants, and inanimate objects aren't rational is because they have no, um, like we do, no development of culture art, language, music, things like this. That's one uh, piece of evidence that philosophers often use to say um, humans are the only rational beings because there's no, um, they often use culture as an interesting standard, which, which is kind of a cool thing to think about that, um, yeah, animals can act in amazing ways and like build amazing nests and things like this, but, and there's instinct there and there's something like reason there sometimes, but it's not the same kind of profoundly um, dignified and powerful thing that we have as reason where we can order ourselves, create, invent, develop, create art, and things like this. So that's why we'd say that those things lack reason, but they still act as if they have reason. Therefore, there must be something with reason that gave them the natures that they have in order to pursue those goals. So, so God gave each thing its own particular nature that compels it to act in a particular way. That's what he means. Okay. So, there's other demonstrations, some of which involve scientifically uh, supported hypotheses, more modern um, arguments that are becoming kind of in fashion or, um, not in fashion, but popular nowadays in, uh, in academia. So, we'll talk about a couple of those, two of those in particular. One guy, how could you not believe this guy? Look at, look at that. <laughs> If you, wonder, if you wondered why I'm growing out my hair, it's for that. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping to get. Hoping to get there. Um, yeah. So, because I already got the dress. And, uh, okay. Okay. So, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, which is just fun to say, that's why I chose this argument. Um, what we'd call in general cosmological argument. The arguments we've been giving already can be called, in a sense, cosmological arguments. That is, looking at nature, looking at the universe, looking at reality in general, and deducing uh, from certain uh, phenomena that we see, deducing God's existence. So Leibniz has one, and he starts with this. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. And then he says, either in its own nature or in an external cause. That means only this, that whenever we see something, if questioned, we'll try and point to a cause of it. Like we wouldn't accept something just popping into existence. Even if it did, we would say that's some kind of trick or magic. What is its actual cause? Even with, um, you know, with magic, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, we know there's something there. Nothing pops into existence out of nothing. Nothing is without explanation altogether. 
Okay, everyone would agree to that, even if at first they just decided to be snooty and deny that premise. If, if you said, so you think a, um, like a giant six-foot bunny could just appear in the middle of this room, they would say, no, probably not. Or even if it did, even if it did, they would say, okay, where's the, where did it come from? Where are the strings? Basically just saying everything that exists has a cause or an explanation of some kind. No big deal. That's kind of a simple observation to begin with again. Now, the little parentheses part, either in its own nature or in an external cause. That means either something has an explanation, it is a sufficient explanation to itself, like something is a necessary being that it just must exist, or, and this is the case for everything else but God, it has an explanation outside of itself. So why do I exist? Because of my parents. Why does that tree exist? Because of whatever seedling it was. Next premise. If the universe has an explanation, the explanation is God. That seems like a bold statement, but this is why. If the universe as a whole, if by that we mean all of sensible created reality, okay, everything that can be seen or known in the universe, the entire universe, all material reality, then the cause, the explanation of those things can't be like those things. Meaning, it cannot be a corporeal or material being, it cannot be finite, it cannot be temporal or bound by time, because the universe uh, involves time, material, things like this. So the explanation of the universe can't be like it, because that doesn't explain anything. It has to be something outside of the universe that explains it. That's why he says, if the universe has an explanation, the explanation is God. Next premise, very simple, the universe exists, therefore it has an explanation, because everything that exists has an explanation, which was the first premise, okay? Therefore, the explanation of the universe is God. Okay, that's his basic argument. It seems very simple, but it needs to be argued to a bit also. The disputed premise, most probably, is the second premise. If the universe has an explanation, its explanation is God. But that must be so, because look at the alternative. If the explanation is not God, then the argument must be made either that the universe exists by necessity of its own nature, meaning it has always existed and will always exist, which is scientifically disproven that the universe has always existed and will always exist. That's simply not true, as known by scientists. So that's one alternative, that it exists by necessity, but that can't be, or that some other external, non-corporeal, infinitely powerful being outside of the universe ha is the explanation. But this would be describing God, which is what our answer is. So either it, the explanation of the universe is God, or the explanation of the universe is the universe just exists by necessity. But that can't be held because the universe at one point did not exist, and in the future will cease to exist. Okay? Pretty simple. Now here's a fun-looking fella. His name is Al-Ghazali. Okay? And this is a, a cosmological argument that's used a lot nowadays. Uh, its biggest proponent is a, a, a Protestant apologist named William Lane Craig, Dr. William Lane Craig. And he is basically um, the man. Okay? He goes to any place that will have him, any university that will have him, any professor that would like to debate him, and debates uh, questions like this, whether or not God exists, whether or not there's objective morality, whether or not the soul is uh, immaterial and immortal, things like this. And he absolutely just like mops the floor with people, but he does it really, really kindly. He's like really, really nice about it. He, uh, he's brilliant, a brilliant thinker, really, really uh, logically uh, clear and sound. And he'll go and you have these um, professors that make these arguments and they're, they look rather trendy most of the time, atheistic professors. And Dr. William Lane Craig is a total nerd looking guy. I mean, he's just, he's got the suspenders and the thick glasses and you think, oh, this guy's not gonna bring much to the table. But he is incredible. And he is one of the biggest proponents of this argument because he's really up on his philosophy and logic, but also on the state of science. He really keeps up on uh, scientific discoveries and studies and, and things like this. So he's really uh, a powerful weapon in uh, the whole uh, debate about God's existence. And he will go anywhere. And he, you can go to his uh, website called Reasonable Faith, reasonablefaith.org, and you can watch these debates that are sometimes three hours long. And uh, usually it will start with an opening statement by him and then the other uh, professor, then a rebuttal, a rebuttal, second rebuttal, etc. And then there's questions. And to watch him uh, so clearly and masterfully um, explain and defend the faith is really incredible. Uh, I'd really recommend that you, that you watch at least clips of his explanations because he's much clearer than I am. 
So this is the argument in its, uh, in its basis. Whatever begins to exist has a cause, much very similar to Leibniz's argument. The universe began to exist. That's the one we'll argue to in a second. Therefore, the universe has a cause. That's the argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, which we'll argue to. And therefore, the universe has a cause. And the, the kind of cause that is, we'll talk about. So premise one is obviously true, like I said. Things just don't come into existence without any explanation. Everything has an explanation, a cause of its existence, if it begins to be. Um, we just intuit that that's true. And by experience, we see that it's true. We've never experienced something that is totally without any kind of explanation or cause. Did you have a question, Jim? I can see that this is beautiful, but what about the people that say the Big Bang theory? Oh, we'll get to the Big Bang. That actually supports our theory. Yeah, we'll get to that. So we don't see it happening around us all the time, even at all, actually. Okay, so what about the second premise, that the universe began to exist? That's the big one. A couple things. Now we get, we get to sound really smart here by saying like Einstein and, and, and Big Bang and stuff like this. So this is what I like, that uh, I get to feel like a scholar. So everyone knows the second law of thermodynamics, right? Okay, thought so. Okay, so the universe is slowly running out of energy or things are tending to disorder. Okay, you've heard of uh, entropy. Everything's tending to disorder. Okay, that shows that if the universe were eternal in the past, infinite in the past, that uh, depletion of energy would already have happened. That's just necessarily true. It just can't be otherwise. If the universe were eternal in the past, there would now be no energy. Okay, if that makes any sense. It's hard to comprehend because that's just an impossible situation. But if it were eternal in the past, we would already have run out of energy and to we've been at total disorder already. So it shows, it points to the fact that there must be a beginning, a starting point at which the universe began to decrease in energy and tend towards entropy, okay? The second thing, um, scientific discoveries of more uh, recent uh, origin. So general theory of re re relativity, so we can talk about the history of the universe, the past history of the universe, um, beginning with Einstein with real clarity. Okay, and when we get to closer to the, uh, the Big Bang, this is where we, I really like to talk about the Big Bang, is because the beginnings of it were actually developed by a man named Georges Lemaire, Father Georges Lemaire. Okay? He is actually the, um, and even by Einstein's admission, the real origin of the, uh, an absolute temporal, spatial beginning of the universe that will later become to be called the Big Bang. Okay? So this idea, was not only, is not only um, uh, compatible with our faith, the creation of the universe, but in fact, it kind of helps support this uh, argument for God's existence. And Father Georges Lemaire was uh, a good friend of Einstein, and here Einstein is saying, hey, turns out faith and reason work together. And Father Georges Lemaire is saying, that's awesome, I'm a priest. That's the, <laughs> that's, that's the caption there, so that's what they're saying. Then he's saying, I think they're taking a picture right now. This is going to be awesome. Okay. <laughs> so, Georges Lemaire and uh, Alexander Friedman together predicted that the universe had this absolute beginning. That was uh, made, uh, it was confirmed by Edwin Hubble's discovery of redshift. Okay. Detecting uh, light from distant universes. Okay. So it showed that the, the universe was expanding, which pointed to the fact that originally it had been uh, at some kind of point, absolute beginning, from which now it is expanding. Then we have, most recently, three cosmologists, Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin. Um, awesome names, by the way. Arvind, Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin prove that, quote, any universe, w and these guys aren't theists, they're not religious types, they're just simply cosmologists. Any universe which has, on average, been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. Okay? Scientific uh, proof there that the universe had a beginning, an actual beginning. They said it's simply impossible scientifically to hold that the universe could be eternal in the past if the said universe, the universe that's observed, has been shown to be expanding on average. Okay? And with Hubble's uh, discovery, that's true. That's necessarily true. This means that all scientists, quote from the same guys, can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe because that's a, a common tool to get out of trying to explain God, saying the, the universe is eternal in the past. Even though that doesn't get, a, get away from the question of God, that's an attempt to get away from it. They no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. 
Okay, there has to be a beginning. This is not some theological theory. It is now scientifically certain that the universe had a beginning. You will find, and I think I put this on your sheets, you will find people that still resist that, or they try to explain this absolute beginning, absolute beginning by any other means possible besides God. For example, you may have heard that um, uh, Stephen Hawking recently, this was last year, maybe two years ago, he said uh, one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard, by which you want to say, stick to your realm and you're not a philosopher. He says, um, the universe caused itself, which violates, if you ever take a logic class, the, the very first law of logic is the law of non-contradiction. That something can't both be and not be at the same time in the same respect. Okay? To say that the universe caused itself is literally nonsensical. There's no rational content to that thought whatsoever. Okay? That's why you might be a brilliant scientist or cosmologist or um, quantum mechanics guru, but when it comes to simple cause and effect, you got no idea what he's talking about. So that was one, I, one way for him to get out of saying that, yes, the universe had a beginning, but it wasn't God. He said the universe caused itself. It literally has no rational, uh, defensible part to it. That just can't be defended. Another person, Dr. Lawrence Krauss, says um, something can come from nothing. So he basically denies the fact that everything that exists must have a cause. And if you read his book on this, which is called Something Can Come From Nothing, um, creative, and he, he basically defines, it's clear, he defines nothing, this is, this is the weirdest thing in the world, defines nothing as um, like the primal energy and things like this of the universe, which by my account is something, okay? Um, but he, but he, in order to say something can come from nothing, which is a, a kind of linchpin of the whole argument that something can't come from nothing, there must be something that gives origin to something else that doesn't just pop into existence. He, in order to deny that, defines nothing as something. Okay. <laughs> Which, so when you try and get out of it, it is, when you try and get out of the beginning of the universe and that beginning being God, you end up just becoming non-rational. Like totally, you're just grasping for any other explanation you can. And those are the two most prominent, prominent voices in the non-theist uh, world that try and say um, belief in God is ridiculous. I mean, what's ridiculous? Simple violations of logic like that, it's just, it's just crazy that they can have so much credence uh, given to them in, um, in popular literature that you can redefine nothing uh, as something. What the heck? Okay. <laughs> okay. Therefore, since the first and second premises have been shown to be true, Namely, that anything that begins to exist must have a cause, true, and that the universe had a beginning, it began to exist, scientifically true, therefore, it's certain that the universe has a cause. Now we've reached a point where we have to ask ourselves, it seems very impersonal, what we've been concluding. A first mover, something that just brought things into existence, something that's just really powerful. How is it that we go from there to the kind of God that we would believe in, like a, a personal God that knows and that loves and things like this? Those attributes are further uh, deduced by St. Thomas after he finishes his five ways. Okay? So it's no criticism of the five ways to say they don't prove a loving personal God. That's not what he intended to do. He intended to first show that God is the first mover, being itself the first cause of all causes, and then to deduce from that that he must be this, this, and that. Okay? And that's what we're going to get to now. What is this cause like? I mentioned this in passing. Since the universe can't cause itself, unless you're Stephen Hawking. Its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably powerful. I would say infinitely, necessarily infinitely powerful. Because if it takes, um, if you make something great out of uh, very little material, you're like really powerful. If you make something even greater with less material, you're even more powerful or more intelligent or greater. You're seen that way. If you can make a lot out of a little. If you make everything out of nothing, then you kind of, your power, your greatness exceeds there to infinity. That's why I would say we can conclude with our reason that God is uh, infinitely powerful, okay? Because he brought everything into existence from nothing. He must be spaceless and immaterial because in order to account for the universe, which is spatial and material, the cause must be other than that, other than the universe, and timeless because time came into existence with the universe because time only exists with motion and motion only exists with things. So God already we know he's timeless, immaterial, and infinitely powerful. Okay? 
there you see the brain a little bit better. So you see the front of it in particular. You can kind of tell in the back there. So it's really pretty and really gross because there's legs sticking out of it. <laughs> so. Okay. These are the next things. And again, each of these has tons of pages in St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae, which all this comes from. But I'm just going to give you a brief explanation of how it is we come to these attributes. That God is simple without composition. Whenever you have composition, whenever you have something that is a combination of two different things or three different things or whatever, then there has to be some account or explanation you give of how that composition came to be. So if you say, um, I'm body and soul, you say, okay, well, how were those two put together? What accounts for the fact that those two are united rather than existing separately? Or uh, Oreos have the, uh, the chocolate part and the cream in the middle. Okay, but like, how did that happen? You know, like, how do these two things come together? Whenever there's composition, there has to be some explanation for that composition. Whenever there's order, composition, or anything, you need to account for that by some means. So God can't be like that. If he's the first cause, there's no composition in him. Otherwise, you'd be pushing that, that first chain we talked about in the first way. You'd be pushing that back a step further. You'd say, okay, this is an, a phenomenon we need to account for, composition in God. What caused that? Then you'd have to move back to something simple. So God has to be ultimately simple because there can't be composition in him. There can't be explanation uh, required of him. He must be necessarily simple. Not simple in the sense that like 2 plus 2 equals 4 is simple. Simple in the sense that there is no composition. God is still infinitely beyond our comprehension. So he's not simple like, oh, he's easy to understand, but simple in that he's not a combination of various realities. Okay? He is necessarily perfect. Perfect meaning fully actual. Um, I'm only a uh, perfect soccer player when I have all the skills a soccer player should have. I'm totally... I fulfilled all my potential as a soccer player or as a, um, a dancer or a singer or whatever. Only when I fulfilled all of my potential can I be called perfect or ideal. So take that idea, that image, and move it to God. Since he accounts for and is the cause of every other thing, he himself can have no potentiality or potential in him that needs to be actualized further. He is fully actual in every sense because he gives perfection to all other things. Okay? That's a very simple, brief explanation of how Thomas argues to God's uh, perfection. The same with his goodness. It's a, uh, a, philosophical, a philosophical concept that being and goodness go together. The more being something has, the better it is. So we would say a rock is kind of low in the order of creation. Plants kind of have more dignity because they have kind of more being to them. There's more to them. Animals still more dignified with more being to them. They have a uh, sensitive nature. They can move, they can feel, etc. And then man... Uh, can reason, can feel, can understand beauty. The more being you have, there's a more goodness that can be said. This isn't moral goodness, like I'm not morally good just because I'm a man with reason as opposed to an animal, but I have a certain kind of goodness to me, a goodness of creation that belongs to me in a greater degree than it does in, say, a rock or whatever, gum smushed on the ground. Okay? There's this level of goodness. And God being I infinitely perfect being, he is therefore infinitely good. He is, when we say good, something is good, we mean it's desirable. It is something we tend towards. That's why God, as infinitely good, is not just our creator and beginning, but also our final end. So all things came forth from God, and we all tend back to God. All of creation tends back to God, because he's the ultimate good, the infinite good, that which all things desire. Okay, so that's something to meditate on. I'll give you a second. <laughs> Okay, uh, God is necessarily infinite. Why is this? Because whenever anything has limits or definition to it, there again needs to be a, an accounting of that, an explanation of that. Something is limited by, in our experience, something is only limited by matter. Okay, what do I mean by that? Human nature um, becomes limited when it takes place in a certain human being. We're limited, we're not, fi we're not infinite, we're finite like this. Um, something that has no material limits no limits of composition, no limits of power can be said to be, in every sense of the word, the deepest sense of the word, infinite. There's no boundaries to it whatsoever because there's nothing there to, outside of itself, limit it. God is outside of all created reality and therefore has no limit to him. 
He has infinite perfection, infinite goodness. Uh, he's simple, which far from limiting him makes him infinite because there's nothing that defines him, that limits him, that composes, that's composed in him that would make him less than infinite. He's unchangeable. This goes back to the first way. He's an unmoved mover. If God himself were to be in motion, that would require an explanation, much like the things we see in nature that are in motion. If God were of that sort, then we haven't found God. Okay, we would require an unmoved mover, something that accounts for the motion we see in nature. So God is unchangeable, immutable, cannot have any change whatsoever. Because if there were change, think about what change is. It's some potential becoming actualized. It's something that was not there before taking place or coming to be. That simply can't happen in God because that would require an explanation. And God is, by definition, the first mover, unmoved. And he is eternal, not bound by time. Does anyone know the definition of eternal uh, given by Boethius and St. Thomas Aquinas? Of course you do. Um, <laughs> the definition of eternity, we usually think of like a really long period of time, which makes heaven seem somewhat boring if that were the case, if, e if eternity was just like a long time, really long time. Like if you're like right now thinking if eternity is anything like this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I do not want to go to heaven. Wow. Um, eternity is, is less a succession of time because God is outside of time. Like I said, time only exists when you have creation, when you have things. God is eternal. He's not, doesn't experience any succession of moments. God cannot become bored. Okay? It's more like uh, eternity is an eternal, like a, a moment. It's like a moment. If you think about a joyful moment, it's like the, the endurance of that moment without succession. It's, it's impossible to think of because we simply have no experience of that. But you can think about it this way, something that uh, I talked about this in our, um, the talk a couple weeks ago on the resurrection and heaven, that when you have, um, you're having a lot of fun, it's a really joyful moment, those usually pass, at least in your experience, really, really quickly. Like if you were um, uh, Christmas, Christmas, perfect example, assuming you like Christmas. Um, Christmas Day usually goes by very, very quickly. And the build-up to Christmas is usually very, very long because you're anticipating it. And when Christmas gets there, it usually <coughs> passes by like that. Or when family comes to visit and they stay for however long, no matter how long they stay, when they leave, it seems like it went by like that. Okay? Um, take that and place yourself in a moment of infinite joy and you can kind of get at how you can experientially think of eternity. That it's something that will be uh, a moment of joy, but it never ends. Weird. Okay. That opposed to um, what we would experience as eternity like in hell, which would be um, when you're sitting at a boring talk, no matter how long it is, no matter how long it is, I don't know why you're laughing, um, as if I were referencing my own talk, uh, no matter how long it is, it's always going to seem much longer than it actually was. She's like, whoa, that talk was at least four hours long. Like, no, it was an hour and a half. Okay. So, okay, so now what? Given the demonstrated fact of God's existence and the list of his attributes, which point to a personal, infinitely good, infinitely powerful, all-knowing God, it follows that it is overwhelmingly probable and expected that God would reveal himself to his creatures. Why? Okay, first of all, he's infinitely good. We can tell because he's infinitely powerful, he didn't need to create or to begin the universe. Will. So that God has an intellect and a will. That is, he is a personal God. Personal in the sense that we can know and we can love. So already these point to a knowing and loving God who is infinitely good. That's why it's overwhelmingly probable that we would expect sometime in history that God would intervene and reveal himself to us. We're given the ability to know him with our intellect, to love him with our will, and he himself has intellect and will and the power to intervene in history. Therefore, it's uh, almost certain, maybe we can just say overwhelmingly probable, that God would reveal himself in history. So now our task is to look at the most probable, probably, oops, probable historical evidence for such a revelation. So now we scan, at the point we are now, knowing that God exists and that he is the sort of God that would reveal himself in history, we scan history for the most likely evidence of that happening. Okay? That's what leads to the second step of apologetics, the Christian apologetics. We look at the Gospels as historical documents and look at the evidence of their reliability. 
If their reliability is established, then we have the best historical witness to a probable revelation of this personal God in history. So, um, the reason why we would expect the Gospels, we would look to the Gospels first, is simply by the, um, the overwhelming impact and unparalleled impact that the Gospels have had uh, in human history compared to any other religion. Um, in terms of their uh, concrete historical um, rooting, and by that I mean in Christianity everything stands or falls on history. If Christ didn't actually exist in history and didn't actually raise from the dead, if he wasn't who he said he was, he didn't actually exist, then everything we believe is a sham. It's not just something we think up to make ourselves feel better. It rests on history, which gives it also credibility because it's never been historically disproved. On the contrary, the historical evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of Christianity. That's not why we believe, but if pressed on the point, we have great evidence that historically we're set, rationally we're set. It's not some illusion or some hope that God exists. It's not like these mythological um, characters that are just used to embody certain virtues or vices or used to like embody the hope of the human spirit and things like this. No, it's historical. It actually happened. If it didn't actually happen, if it wasn't recorded in history, we couldn't know about it, then things would be very different. So that's why knowing God exists, knowing who He is, that He would reveal Himself in history, we now look at the Gospels merely as historical documents, not as divinely inspired books, not as uh, inerrant books inspired by the Holy Spirit, but as historical witnesses to certain historical events. That's what the second step of apologetics is. And if it's established that to all, uh, according to all criteria, that these are reliable historical witnesses, and you'll see that's overwhelmingly the case, more than any other historical document we have, in fact, not just that the Gospels like, match up to historical documents, but the credence we give to uh, really unquestioned historical documents is nothing compared to the evidence we have for the reliability of the Gospels. That gives you a little teaser for how um, interesting the second step is. But once we show, if we show, that God actually revealed Himself in history and did so in the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, then we are equipped to look at what Christ said and move to the third step of apologetics. So, that's where we're at right now. The next time we will look at the Gospels as historical documents and determine whether or not uh, they actually faithfully and honestly and authentically represent what we assume they do.